Good morning, New Brunswick, and welcome to the New Brunswick Today Show for Wednesday, September 14th. Thanks for starting your morning with us. We're proud to be coming at you live from uh, our Facebook page today. We'll be interviewing Walter Lures. He's the president of the New Jersey Foundation for Open Government, so stay tuned for that just a little later today. Now, the great thing about our show is that you can listen in the background while you read some of the excellent articles that are available on NewBrunswickToday.com. Since our last show, we've published more than 15 articles that we want to let you know about. Plus, we're going to give you an inside look at what to expect to see here in the near future on NewBrunswickToday.com. But first, today's weather report. It's going to be another hot one in New Brunswick today in the Hub City with sunshine and a few afternoon clouds. The high is going to be around 90 degrees again. Winds are coming from the west at uh, 5 to 10 miles an hour. We've also got a number of traffic alerts today. If you're coming to downtown New Brunswick, be ready for lane reductions and detours all day long, right behind us, one block away from here. You can see them doing the work right there. That's Byers Street. It's going to be the site of a paving project between George Street and Elm Row, as well as between Kirkpatrick Street and Connector Way. That's until 5 p.m. today. So as a result, parking on Byers Street will be suspended all day, with the exception of one block between Elm Row and Kirkpatrick Street. That's the block next to that county administration building, the big building behind me. Also, Lee Avenue is going to be reduced to a single lane at Loretto Street from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. George's Road is reduced to a single lane between Commercial Ave and Jones Ave until 4 p.m. And once again, Wilcox Road is going to be closed until 4 p.m. for that sewer construction. Now, today, during our show, and really any time of the day that you want to reach out, we're happy to take your calls at 732-993-9697. If you have something you want to share with us or a story you want to talk about, question you have, we also would appreciate if you comment on this video uh, with your questions and feedback, uh, as well as you can also reach out to us on our Twitter account. It's uh, at NB underscore today. And uh, please do us a favor, share this video with your friends. You're right here on Facebook right now. Share it so we have a bigger audience and share this information with more people. Um, we are the only live show broadcasting out of New Brunswick. And uh, later today, you can also find us on our YouTube channel, the New Brunswick Today YouTube channel, and uh, on the right-hand side of our fabulous NewBrunswickToday.com website. But before we get to all those stories, we have some breaking news. New Brunswick Today has learned that the power is out on Cook Douglas campus for the third time in two days. That's the Cook Douglas campus of Rutgers over in the second ward. These are some of the photos that we received from a reader uh, in the Nelson Dining Hall when the power went out around uh, uh, shortly before 9 a.m. Uh, we just went on the air at 10 a.m. And uh, it wasn't the first time that the power's gone out at the Cook Douglas campus. Most of the campus was affected. Last night was a little scary on that Cook Douglas campus where the power outage affected most of the buildings for about four hours, according to police. At 11.30 p.m. last night, after the problem was resolved, the issue, uh, the university issued a alert to the community that its Division of Institutional Planning and Operations will continue to monitor the situation and provide updates as appropriate. Uh, police told us that as of last night, the cause of the outage was unknown. Um, and we just got word, actually, that the student centers on the Cook Douglas campus are now closed. Uh, there's no word on uh, what the cause of this is or what the impact is going to be uh, on classes. People are unsure of uh, whether they want to take the trip to Cook Douglas today to be in buildings that are going to probably be very hot if they don't have air conditioning. Um, we also, uh, uh, like I said, police told us the cause is unknown. We're still looking into that. And uh, as we reported yesterday, more negative news out of Rutgers. Students had a rude welcome on their first day of classes when the school's computer networks were once again harmed by a uh, distributed denial of service attack. It's been hard to keep track of just how many times the school's been hit with attacks like those in recent years. You can read our latest article on that topic at the NewBrunswickToday.com website. We also just published a story about a student who was able to climb on top of one of the new buildings recently erected on College Avenue. The scene of the incident was the former home of the university's beloved grease trucks, which were kicked out to make way for a massive 443-bed dormitory. According to multiple sources, the inebriated student climbed up the decorative wooden panels that make up some of this building's facade with ease before falling at about 1.47 a.m. on September the 9th. 
the student lives in the uh, brand new dormitory right next door at the College Avenue and Hamilton Streets, dubbed the Yard at College Avenue. And that student was hospitalized after suffering serious injuries in that 20 foot fall. Now, uh, Devco is the private company that worked with Rutgers to build this building, and uh, we, we spoke to the president of Devco yesterday. He, he, his quote is, he said, we understand that a student was involved in a fall at the yard early Sunday morning, and RUPD responded. Uh, that was Chris Palladino, president of the New Brunswick Development Corporation, it's commonly referred to as Devco. Uh, they built that 14-story building that surrounds this uh, smaller building. Uh, the student did not fall from the high-rise building, but rather this smaller structure still under construction in the center of that courtyard, and uh, that is slated to become a Starbucks coffee shop expected to open later this fall. Um, the matter is, quote, under review by both the university and RUPD, said Palladino. He declined to answer our question about whether the design of that building is going to be changed to prevent it from being climbed by more students. Now, Rutgers isn't the only educational institution that we're going to be covering on this program today. Last week, we brought you some news from the Perth Amboy Board of Education. But as always, our heart and soul is right here in New Brunswick. And there is precious little that's more important for us to cover than the public school system here that serves 10,000 kids. On the NewBrunswickToday.com website, right now you can see articles about three different NBHS sports teams, thanks to our phenomenal sports reporter, Stephen Roca. So you can read about the girls' tennis team. Uh, winning their season opener, opener over Colonia High School 4-1, to one, as well as the boys' soccer team uh, enduring an overtime bout against St. Joseph's High School in their second match of the year. They actually ended up in a draw, 2-2 uh, two to two in that game. They actually just won another match yesterday, making them 2-0-1 oh, on the season. Unfortunately, the New Brunswick Zebra football team didn't fare so well in their first matchup since being realigned to the more competitive red division of the Greater Middlesex Conference. They lost on Friday night to uh, Piscataway, uh, the Chiefs, by a score 38, or, sorry, 39 to 18. Uh, make sure you read Stephen's story on that to learn just how big a factor the heat was. Now, Friday was similar to today. We had 91 degree heat, uh, 91 degree high that day, uh, by some counts as high as 93 degrees. And that was also the day that we reported three elementary schools in New Brunswick were forced to close early. Uh, the district said it was, quote, due to inclement weather, uh, but we didn't get a drop of rain or a, drop, or a flake of snow. So we followed up and confirmed with the district that it was indeed the lack of air conditioning that was responsible for those three schools closing. You can check out that story on our website, including the reactions of one angry parent of a student at Roosevelt School who is fed up. Now, the one thing that all the schools, uh, that all the schools forced to close have in common is that they are very old. At least one of them is actually more than a century old. It's called Lincoln School. Now, last night was back to school night at the district's newest facility, which the district is calling the Lincoln Annex. It's uh, an addition to the lineup meant to ease the overcrowding at the 106-year-old facility on Bartlett Street. Uh, this, uh, you might remember the new school from its previous life as a school. It was, of course, home to St. Peter's Elementary and high schools, Catholic schools that served the greater New Brunswick area until about 2010 when they were closed. So last night we sent our youngest reporter, Mr. Carlos Ramirez, to back to school night at the Lincoln Annex. Now, Carlos is such a good reporter that when he had the chance to meet the district superintendent, Aubrey Johnson, for the first time, he didn't hold back. Instead of asking some fluffy question or uh, uh, just getting to sit down for an interview maybe one day, Ramirez came right out and asked Superintendent Johnson about an issue that is on the minds of a lot, a lot of parents right now, transportation to the schools. For reasons unknown, the New Brunswick School District changed its protocol this year. It ex now excludes middle school students who live more than one mile from the middle school from getting a free school bus ride to and from NBMS. The state law says it's only required to give those rides to students who live greater than two miles from the school, and the district has decided to change the way they do this and effectively cut out a lot of those students who had previously been getting bus transportation to school. So Mr. Ramirez has been working on a story about this, taking input from community members who've been reaching out to us via our 
Facebook page and other outlets. And he's been asking the district about this busing issue. The superintendent's office hasn't been able to get them to respond or take his calls or respond to his emails. So as you might know, New Brunswick today is proud to be the only bilingual newspaper in New Jersey. And we want to produce as much Spanish language content as possible. Uh, New Brunswick has a lot of folks who prefer Spanish, and we want to serve them, too. We want to be the newspaper for all of New Brunswick. So you, some of you have been asking us to do a Spanish version of this show, and I want to assure you we're working on that. We're working towards that. So today we're proud to take a first step in this direction by bringing you a bilingual broadcast from Mr. Ramirez. He went live on his Facebook page, uh, Carlos Ramirez Today. That was last night outside Back to School Night after he was asked to leave by security guards and after Superintendent Johnson declined to comment on the changes to the transportation protocol used by the district. So now we're going to show you this video. The first half is in Spanish, the second half is in English. Please stay with us and we'll have a lot more for you after this. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Carlos Ramirez, soy reportero de New Brunswick Today. Nos encontramos afuera de la escuela Lincoln Annex en New Brunswick, Nueva Jersey, en la intersección de Division y Somerset. Hace unos minutos el equipo de seguridad de la escuela nos pidió que saliéramos mientras tomábamos fotos y documentábamos el regreso de, a las clases. También tuvimos el placer de conocer al superintendente de las escuelas públicas de New Brunswick, pero se negó a comentar sobre el tema de la transportación que afecta a docenas de estudiantes en el distrito escolar de New Brunswick. Él nos dijo que nos contestaría nuestros mensajes una vez él tenga el tiempo de hacer esto. Pero mientras varios padres de la, del distrito escolar de New Brunswick siguen en espera para transportaciones de sus niños. La escuela Lincoln Annex que abrió este mes, septiembre primero, septiembre 6 de este mes, está localizado al frente del hospital universitario Robert Wood Johnson en Somerset. Esta escuela se espera que reciba a varios estudiantes de diferentes grados. La escuela que sabía hacer la Lincoln en la otra parte va a ser usada como para programas con niños con especialidades especiales y que tienen, son para programas especiales para esos estudiantes y también seguirá con otros estudiantes más de otros grados. En esta escuela se espera que reciba estudiantes de grado 3 a 8 y dependiendo el próximo año recibirá diferentes estudiantes. También hemos contactado al Distrito Escolar de New Brunswick para saber qué es lo que está sucediendo con la transportación para los estudiantes que atienden las escuelas públicas de New Brunswick, pero no hemos recibido ni un comentario de vuelta de ellos. Seguimos mandándoles mensajes y llamadas y correo electrónicos y seguimos en la espera. Se espera que este martes, septiembre 20, sea la reunión del distrito escolar y la de junta educativa. Esperemos que varios padres que tengan preguntas y comentarios sobre estas medidas que han sido puestas en el distrito escolar. Esperemos que los padres lleguen a la escuela en la Mill Somerset, en la New Brunswick High School. La reunión se llevará a cabo en el auditorio de la New Brunswick High School. El evento está abierto al público. Para las personas que no tienen transportación pueden caminar, pero recomendaríamos que empiecen a caminar a las 6 ya que la reunión empieza a las 7. For those who are just watching us right now, we are live at the intersection of Somerset and Division Street in New Brunswick. Where a couple minutes we were asked by security to step out of the school for taking pictures. We also met the superintendent of the New Brunswick Public Schools and we asked them regarding the transportation that is affecting dozens of students in the district that are not being offered transportation. We're not sure what the reason is, but parents are still concerned and upset due to the fact that winter is just around the corner and they do not have transportation for their children. The superintendent told us that he will not comment at this time regarding the transportation, but he will contact us once he has time to. Thank you, Carlos. Now, we'll have a lot more for you on that story in the coming days as 
Carlos Ramirez continues to get answers about this. The word on the street is that parents are planning to come to the only Board of Education meeting this month. It's scheduled for Tuesday, September 20th at 7 p.m. in the New Brunswick High School. All are welcome. It's open to the public. Now, we have a great show for you today. We want to get to our guest, Walter Lures, but real quick, I uh, just wanted to let you know about some of the other stories, great stories you can find on the New Brunswick Today website. Uh, first, authorities announced that Township maintenance workers had alerted police to an apparent break-in at a vacant home somewhere on Joyce Kilmer Avenue in North Brunswick, which in turn led them to find a dead body in that house. Middlesex County Prosecutor Andrew Carey did not identify the victim. Uh, it was a man whose body was discovered by police the morning of September 12th. We've also got a great story by Dave Schatz, our business reporter. He wrote about a U.S. congresswoman who is calling on the federal government to investigate allegations of wage theft against the restaurant chain Chipotle, which, of course, has locations right here in downtown New Brunswick as well as another in East Brunswick. Now, there's actually over, uh, additionally, 10,000 workers who filed a class action lawsuit alleging the company uh, that the company shorted them on their paychecks. Now, our newest reporter, Ben Strauss, joins the team. He has a great story about the Williams Company's controversial plans for a natural gas compressor station in Franklin Township. It's a spark fierce local opposition there. We do have one correction to make from our broadcast last Wednesday. We regret that we got the first name of a recent murder victim incorrect in our broadcast, and we apologize for the error. We do have an update on that story for you today. Authorities are now offering a $2,000 reward for anyone who can provide information leading to the whereabouts and arrest of Isaiah J. Bell, according to a statement from the Somerset County Prosecutor's Office. Bell, a 21-year-old man who also goes by the nickname Ike, is wanted in connection with the September 5th slaying of James Cargo, who died following an altercation with Bell in the area of Coventry Lane and Westminster Road. Now, authorities said Bell is described as six foot one, weighing 160 pounds, and having brown eyes and brown hair. During the altercation, Mr. Cardbo sustained injuries, which would prove to be fatal. But each of the three statements the SCPO has released, police say that Bell fled from the area in a four-door sedan and claimed to have recovered that sedan. But Cardbo was not as fortunate. Mr. Cardbo. Uh, this is according to the press release, entered his vehicle, which his six-year-old son was sitting in, and attempted to drive onto Route 27, but the vehicle left the roadway and crashed into a nearby medical building uh, that uh, is actually on the North Brunswick side of uh, Route 27 in Middlesex County. However, the SCPO is handling the case because that altercation that proved to be fatal took place in Franklin Township. Uh, it's, act it's at least the second killing this year. Uh, to take place right near the border between Franklin Township and Middlesex County. Uh, on April 9th, Franklin police shot and killed Diallo Grant after chasing him across the county line into New Brunswick. So check out all of those stories and uh, much more that we can't get to today. But uh, I do want to let you know what you're in store for tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow we're going to have an update on the trial of the former Perth Amboy police chief Benjamin Ruiz. That's going on right across the street from us. We've been sitting in on some fascinating testimony just yesterday. The state rested its case, and this morning, presumably uh, right about now, the defense is now getting a chance to make their case. Uh, tomorrow, we also have a very special guest, Teresa Vivar, who will be joining us uh, on the New Brunswick Today Show. She's a community activist and the leader of Lazos America Unida. Um, we are also pleased to follow up on our past reporting about the battle over paid sick leave, and we can confirm that the petition for an ordinance to uh, revise the paid sick leave law in New Brunswick that was prepared to go to the ballot as a yes or no question, that petition, that ordinance has been withdrawn by the New Jersey Working Families Alliance. We got word of that recently. We wanted to share it with you. We'll have a lot more on that later today on our website. Keep an eye out for a great story by uh, one of our writers, Khalil Dean. Now, uh, before we uh, get to our uh, special guest today, uh, we just wanted to take a moment to share our condolences with a New Brunswick family that we're very close with and, uh, and are very dear to our hearts. We want to um, uh, 
send our deepest condolences to the Cato family. Naif Cato was a resident of New Brunswick who recently passed away. Uh, he was a great man, a beloved man, and he leaves behind a very great family, including uh, uh, two folks, uh, two very talented sons, Jad and Bassam, who've both been contributors for New Brunswick today, and we want to, at this difficult time, wish them well and, uh, and, and um, uh, extend our deepest sympathies to the family. Um, now, our special guest is uh, very special. He is one of the top attorneys in the state when it comes to transparency. He's actually the president of the New Jersey Foundation for Open Government. He's represented me in uh, a couple of cases now, and we have some interesting stories to share. We also want to tell you about an event where you can learn more about the Oprah Laws, the public records law here in New Jersey. But we'll get to that in just a minute. First, just to give you a taste, we want to show you a clip of me fighting with the New Brunswick Housing Authority about the Oprah Law. Take a look. We'll be right back with Walter Lewis. I am uh, continue to be disappointed by the Housing Authority's response to my public records requests. There is a request that I made on October the 6th, mm -hmm. seeking something that should be not very hard to produce, which is just simply the records of uh, the bills that various commissioners and employees of the agencies incur when they go away on trips uh, for, uh, I guess, classes or seminars, uh, conferences, those types of things. Um, that request was made on October 6th, and I still have not received those documents. I'm you will, you will follow up. The attorney will follow up on that. Okay. Can I can can I hear what the what the follow up is on those specific documents, the ones I requested on October 6th? If, if I may, um, as as you know, we've responded uh, a number of times uh, with regard to the open request. The latest response uh, we provided a response earlier today um, with some additional documents. The housing Authority continues to work on it, and as we indicated in my email of February 11th, we in, intend to uh, to have the remainder of those responses to you shortly. And, and I believe I put in a specific date in there as well. So, so the end of the month was yes. the date. So every everything by the end of the month. That's that's what we're anticipating, and and we will respond accordingly. Mr. So. Chair, how many years of, of request that Mr. Crowley Bill in the front of today's paper is asking for? with these issues? How many years do these want to go back? Yeah, several requests. Uh, there's, there's a number of requests. Um, I, I don't have them all in front of us tonight, but I know um, Five years, several, years, several years. go back uh, a number of years, yes. Uh, sure. Yes, yes, uh, uh, several go back, I believe, 10 years. 10 yeah. years, yeah. So it would take some time, right? But I know we're under state guidelines where we do have to get them that information. Absolutely, and and we have uh, you know worked with with him in good faith to to respond to this. And certainly, there's there's a number of documents that have been asked for, and um, you know, and just to, again to reiterate to the, to the board, uh, the housing authority is extremely limited in its resources as far as staffing uh, is concerned, and and it has uh, made every attempt. Um, you know, from uh, from our standpoint, from uh, third party standpoint, uh, they've made every attempt to make this response, and, and we've worked with them to uh, to do so as uh, diligently as we can. Now, there 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 is a cost, correct? Uh, Mr. Caldwell did bring up a cost for getting all this information to Mr. Crowderville, so that money is coming out of the housing authority budget. Sure, there's a cost. Now, the, the documents are being provided electronically. Uh, Mr. Craddaville's asked for that. Um, so there is a cost as far as time um, and, and effort by the staff uh, in order to not only put those documents, uh, some of which are not in electronic format, to put those in electronic format to provide to him, um, but also uh, in the time and gathering it and, and going back in, in storage and gathering that. So in essence, that money would be taken away from our residents because it's coming out of the budget? It's, it's, uh, there's a cost in responding. Uh, that's, that's what I'll, I'll leave it at. There's, there's a cost to the agency in responding, just as in any response. Thank so. you.
Welcome back. We're now joined by Walter Lures, who I just learned is actually now the vice president of NJ Foundation for Open Government. Yes. Thank you for joining us today, and thank you for the work you do. Uh, you're welcome. It's my pleasure. Cool. So, the thing I love about your organization is you guys practice what you preach. You really try to be a transparent organization. You hold public meetings. You elect officers. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you just got done with five years of being the president of this organization. So, yes. tell folks, what, how did you end up doing that? And what do you guys seek to do as an organization? Well, as an organization, we're actually the only nonprofit in New Jersey that focuses on improving and lobbying uh, for good amendments to the Old Public Records Act and the Old Public Meetings Act. So we, very broadly speaking, we focus on, on two things. Uh, whenever there's amendments to the legislation, we try to lobby for improvements. And we also do our best to educate the public about the Old Public Records Act and the Old Public Meetings Act. Right, so you guys are kind of like a watchdog to make sure that this law remains in force, that uh, the, the most important things are, are um, uh, available, the most important records are available. That's been a bit of a struggle lately, um, especially with some court decisions that have come down from the appellate court. Can you tell us what types of records can people actually get through over like Videos, documents, what's, what's at stake here? Well, sure. I mean, the answer, unfortunately, is that it depends. For your audience, I think the most important types of records to get are meeting minutes and uh, lawsuit documents, such as complaints and settlement agreements, because that's where a lot of the dirty work of government happens. Uh, one of the things that John Path does is he gets, he tracks lawsuits against public entities, and then when those cases settle, oftentimes for hundreds of millions of dollars, excuse me, hundreds of thousands of dollars, not millions of dollars. In the, in the aggregate, it's hundreds of millions of dollars. But individual towns will settle lawsuits for tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars. That's a good way for, for local folks to see how their public money is being spent. Right. Often this stuff doesn't make its way onto the city council agenda. It just gets handled through some insurance firm. And lots of money can get paid out to people who've sued. So what you're saying is under the public records law, you can request... Uh, copies of, say, all the lawsuits that have been filed against your hometown, and then also the settlement agreements that resolve those lawsuits. So that those are public documents, without a doubt? Absolutely. It's very rare for towns to make announcements when they're sued and when they settle lawsuits. And in fact, you're absolutely right. It's with done quietly, almost always. Yes, that's absolutely correct. And sometimes... The towns might not even know about the settlements because if they've delegated total authority to their insurance carriers to handle the, to handle the lawsuits, sometimes that will include the actual settlement of the matter. So you can absolutely have a situation where a lawsuit is filed, the clerk is served, the clerk will just hand it to the insurance carrier, and the insurance carrier will handle it the rest of the way. There, might, there literally might not even be a vote on whether to settle a case. It just handled beginning to end by the carrier. So, you know, as a member of the community, you have to be proactive in getting that information, making the over requests, figuring out which lawsuits have been filed, and then making over requests about settlements. So sometimes the city council might not even know that the case has been settled or how much it was settled for in taxpayer money, but a regular person like us could just request it and get, get that information and share it with the public. And you mentioned John Path. He's kind of a legendary open government advocate here. And so he does this en masse, right? He always is finding out different settlements and exposing them and putting them on his website. Yes. He's going to be in uh, Perth Amboy on September 20th for a very special event. You're also going to be there. Tell yes. us, what can people expect to learn if they attend this free event you're, you're putting on? Uh, sure. Well, you, know, you remember from before I said that one of the things we do is education. So that's exactly what this is about. On September 20th in Perth Amboy, uh, I believe it's 7 p.m. and information about the Knights of Columbus, location. 228 Thank High you. Street. We just published an article on it a few hours ago. People Excellent. can check out New Brunswick there. That's how if you want more info. And you can sign up online and tell people mm -hmm. what are they going to get out of this night if they come there. Uh, so we're, we're going to talk about the Old Public Re Records Act and the Old Public Meetings Act. We're going to talk about what records are subject to access. We're going to talk about uh, what the requirements of the Meetings Act are in terms of when your town meets, uh, what issues can they discuss uh, behind closed doors. 
what do they have to put in their minutes, and we're going to talk about how you can use Oprah. Essentially, what we're talking about right now, how you can use Oprah to get information about how your town works. Right. And so, you're very experienced at this. You've actually, you know, gone through some situations where the, the city or the town or the agency doesn't want to give up the documents, but under Oprah, there's actually a way for you to bring it to that building across the street, to the county right. courthouse, and, and you've represented uh, dozens, right, of, of litigants who, who've been seeking records that they've been denied. Tell us, how does that work? Uh, is, is that something you do on a contingency basis? Is that something you, uh, when you see a case you like, you take it? Sure, uh, yes. <laughs> and the answer to your question is yes. So in, in my private law practice, uh, we filed in the last, since 2013, excuse me, since January 2013, we filed about 160, 170 new Oprah lawsuits across the state. And that doesn't include appeals, it doesn't include government records council cases, that's just Oprah cases in Superior Court in places like Middlesex County uh, Courthouse right across the street from us. Um, when someone is denied access to records, you have about, not about, you have 45 days after the denial to file a lawsuit. So you, know, you members of your audience, if you ask for records and you're denied, you have to move fast. I actually had a situation just yesterday where a, a very sophisticated records requestor asked for records and they were denied access, but the denial was back in July. So the 45 days had already passed. Too late to challenge so, it. Well, too late to challenge that request, but that's a situation where he says, well, look, uh, reframe it, refile it, and then, you know, come, come to me sooner. <laughs> um, so this is the, 40, the 45 days goes by very quickly. And, and frequently, one of the things I like to do is if we get someone who comes in the door with uh, a denial, sometimes we'll try to negotiate with the other side, especially if it's folks who I know are reasonable. You know, some, some towns are more reasonable than other towns. Uh, if I if, let's say I get a case that I think is a slam dunk, that's not a case I'll necessarily want to bring. If I think it's a slam dunk, maybe I'll send an email or a phone call yeah. to the other side. Say, look, your clerk denied this, but you know, you and I both know it's something that should be disclosed. So can we do this without a lawsuit? Because you know, right now there's this is a little bit of a hot potato. Right now there's a little bit of um, of blowback from some folks who think that there's too many Oprah lawsuits and there's like this cottage industry of, of Oprah lawyers, you know, which, which isn't small literally cottage. true. It is, it is a small cottage. You know, when, when I think of all the cases I've brought, to me, they're all good cases. They're all cases that need to be brought. And if I have a case that I can settle quickly, or if I have a case where I can pick up the phone and get the other side to give me the records quick, then I serve my clients' interests. You know, we don't bring cases to generate fees. Uh, but right now, in the current environment, I have to say that there's there's a feeling that some folks do that. Mm -hmm. So in our practice, we we only try to bring cases where there's you know where there's a conflict, where there's you know, the other side is not going to give the records, and we need the court's assistance. Right, and you've assisted me before. Um, I think a great example of something that we were able to force the government to give us was uh, when we sued to get the uh, secret police maps that said where uh, right. where Rutgers police have jurisdiction to right. pull people over. Um, right. Tell people about that, uh, that that type of you know case and that type of precedent that we. Well, well, sure. That right. And that was that was a good case because you know the reason why we brought that case was because we knew that New Brunswick and Rutgers did not want to produce the, the agreements and the maps. Uh, so that's the case you had to bring. No yeah. amount of negotiation would have got them to produce them. But of course, it was a situation where once you filed a lawsuit, they took you a lot more seriously. Yeah. And unfortunately, yeah. that happens a lot. Um, one of the things that goes on is you have the clerk or you have maybe in-house counsel, and they're a little too myopic. They think a lot of things are confidential that really aren't. You file a lawsuit, outside counsel comes in, maybe outside counsel has a little bit more of an independent view. And yes, that's what, you know, in that case, Rutgers gave us, gave us the maps. Right. Um, 
and, and we ultimately reached a settlement. But frankly, that was a settlement that wouldn't have occurred if we hadn't sued in the first place. It's, it's, it's a shame, but sometimes you need, and this word can be a little pejorative, but sometimes you need the leverage of a lawsuit to get the other side to kind of see the, see the light of death. Sure, sure. And so if folks are out there, they have uh, something they're fighting for, some document or what have you, data, video, any type of record that they want to get from their government, they think they have a case, how can they find it? you have a website? Well, absolutely. I mean, if, if you, can, you can ask us you know, general information questions on, uh, you know, through NJ Fog. So, of course, www.njfog.org. And we have a phone line and we have email where you know, info at njfog.org. You can so you actually help people through the process if they're having trouble as oh, NJ Fog. The answer is yes. We help with general questions. Right. We're not a law firm, so we have to stay away from specific questions. There's sort of always a little bit of a, of a tension there. Mm -hmm. um, but we answer people's general questions. And then when I'm wearing my Moore's Law hat, yes, people can, you know, read for, for like really specific questions. People can reach out to me, my website, you know, I'm on Facebook. What is your... Uh, your Law practices website. Sure, www.moreslaw.com. So it's L U E R S law.com. Exactly. People can find you there if they think they have a case. Now, um, I wanted to ask you about some of these recent developments. There's a lot of things that you know uh, are being debated right now. Videos are increasingly important. Uh, you know, we see surveillance cameras all over almost every government building. If somebody wants to get a hold of those records, that's something that comes up often. But even more often is police videos and police records. People want to get to the bottom of something that they learned about, uh, especially something where there's been, you know, uh, somebody's been seriously injured or arrested on a serious charge. Are people entitled to get those police videos? I mean, we're going to have every cop in New Jersey before we know it wearing, wearing cameras, if not keeping them in their car. Are the, is the public entitled to that, or is that not covered under the well, well, Charlie, that's an excellent question because right now, when it comes to police videos, there's literally a split in the cases on what's disclosable and what's not disclosable. There's a case called, and, and, and the answer is going to come from the Supreme Court probably in the next six to 12 months. Uh, because, you know, one court has said any police video that relates to a criminal investigation is not a public record. So let's say someone. And that's a, and that's a a deviation from what most folks had had been doing. You know, I used, I used to be able to obtain a police video with an open request, and, and within seven days I would get my video that I had asked for. No, no problem. But that that changed just recently. Right. Uh, that, that, that's absolutely correct. In addition, the Oprah judge for this county, Middlesex County, has actually expressed his disagreement in a written opinion with that rule. Now, it's a rule that he follows because he's required to follow he's it. He's a lower court judge, so he yes. has to follow the above court. But he right. warned people that this is going to jeopardize their, their long-held right to these videos yes. at just the time when all these cameras are coming online. Right, and, it's, it's a, it's a fa and that's one of the things that makes it a fascinating issue because you have a situation where the judges who handle the Oprah cases day-to-day, -day, you know, each county has its own designated Oprah judge. Like you know, Middlesex County, Judge Francis is the Oprah judge. More than one of the Oprah judges have expressed disagreement with the concept that a video involving a crime is not a public record because the video is is neutral. You know, the video is probably the best evidence of what actually happened, and so what's the harm in disclosing? The video shows what it shows. Now, there can you know, you, can, you can find an extreme example. Let's say the video shows you know, a murder close up. Well, then there might be a privacy interest in that. Might be. It depends on the facts. But if it's just a, a regular stop, uh, if it's a car chase, you know, and that, that was I think that was the Windhurst case. It was a car chase. There's a car chase and a shooting. Yes. Right. Right. There's we thank you. Yeah. There's there's no legitimate interest in secrecy. It happened in broad daylight. Now, oh, I assume it happened in broad daylight. Happened in the open, right? Out in the public. The public would, you know, anyone who was fortunate or unfortunate enough to, to be there would have seen it anyway. Right. And it's not like a witness interview, or let's say, you know, police notes, or or police, even a police incident report or an investigatory report, uh, or or say a witness statement. Because if you have a witness statement, I understand the theory 
that you wouldn't want the witness statements to become public because maybe the matter will go to trial, you know, that sort of thing. But video, we get video all the time, and it's, it's only grown. So I, I don't see the police interest in non-disclosure. Um, now, you have the Lindhurst case. You have another case out of Ocean County, which went to the appellate division, and those judges said that if you have a local police procedure that requires the video to be made, maintained, or kept on file, that's good enough to make it a public record. So let's say you have a police video involving a stop. Let's say the video, you know, let's say drugs are found. It turns into a full criminal investigation. You still get that video if the local police procedure would require the video to be kept. Uh, and that, that case came down a couple months ago. But like I said, you have, you have a split in the appellate court. And those are, the appellate court, those are the, the best judges. They, they work very hard on the cases. They, they focus on the law. Um, so even at, at that level, you have a split. So ultimately, it'll come down to whatever the Supreme Court right. says. Both those cases are going to the Supreme Court, yes. and they'll make the, the final decision that will affect a lot of you know, what happens to these yeah. videos. Who can see them? Wow. Very exciting stuff. Um, I wanted to also briefly touch on the Open Public Meetings Act. So uh, OPRA is the one that everybody knows and pays attention to. Uh, it's um, you know, pretty popular. Uh, journalists use it all the time, but even you know, citizens and other folks. But the Open Public Meetings Act, not everyone uh, thinks about it so much, but it governs how uh, public meetings are supposed to be run. So things like, um, for instance, uh, are people allowed to come to a government meeting and videotape? Is that something that they're allowed to do in New Jersey? Well, the, the answer is yes. Uh, the videotaping of a meeting is not strictly governed by the Meetings Act. The Meetings Act is technically, it's silent on that issue. But the Supreme Court is held that yes, if it's a public meeting, you have a, a common law right to, to videotape it, as long as you're not breaking any other reasonable rule, like let's say like, like a fire code type situation. Like um, you can't disrupt the meeting, or right. block the entrance or something, or right. run your extension cord uh, in some way that could be a habit. But, right. but if you can bring it, if you can get your camera in there, you can do it without bothering people, you can you can uh, videotape any government meeting in New Jersey in right. public set. I absolutely know. Well, if they tell you no, what should you tell them? Uh, well, you should you should tell them that if it's my understanding I have a right to record this, are you are you directing me to not record it? And then you record them directing you not to record it. And then then you have you have to go to an attorney for that time. You know, no one people have to follow reasonable directions, so even if they're technically unlawful. So if you're in a situation where you're recording a meeting and the mayor directs you to stop, you get that on tape and then you publish it stop. Don't make them arrest you. But the fact that they're directing you to not record, that's a violation. That's something that can be remedied. And so uh, at this upcoming forum, uh, tell folks you know, what ultimately uh, you hope they can happen. What do you think? Um, folks can do when they get home and get back to their community and, and decide to file an open request. What, the, you know, what can be accomplished through that? Right. Well, we want to empower them. So we want them to know the types of records that they can request, how to make a request, and how to spot a, a bad denial. We want to educate them where they get to the point where they know what the circumstances under which they have to call us. And in terms of the Meetings Act, we want them to be able to spot you know, basic issues. When can a uh, when can a, a governing body go into executive session? What can they discuss in executive session? What information is the public allowed to know about what goes on in the executive session? Because that's that's where all the cool stuff is. Right, right. And so those how it says that works basically like they have to take notes when they have those secret meetings, those behind closed doors meetings, and after the issue is resolved then those minutes become public, right? So if you, if you wanted to, you could ask for the past five years worth of executive session minutes, and you could find out what they've been talking about behind closed doors all those years. Well, well Charlie, that's exactly right. Uh, while there can be circumstances where portions of minutes have to stay confidential, for the most part, yes. Uh, when they have secret meetings, we call them closed meetings. Executive session. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> for meetings where the public is barred, uh, they have to maintain the minutes, and the minutes have to be reasonably comprehensible, which
which means you can understand them. And, uh, and then yes, you absolutely should over the mint, over the minutes, because that can show you the types of lawsuits that have been filed and all the things we were talking about before, the lawsuits and the settlements, they'll come up in closed session, but they might not necessarily come up in open session. Okay. So that's one way you can find out about lawsuits and settlements by getting this closed session met. Cool, cool. So uh, everybody should look up our friend John Papp and see some of the work he's done. I know just, just yesterday, I think he broke this story about a town that uh, uh, took the Oprah form off their website right. and replaced it with a PDF that tells you to, you know, basically take a hike. And if you want, to, if you want some doctors, you've got to come to the town hall and drive here and make a couple trips here. Um, but it's actually much easier than that to file an open request, right? Tell people just how easy is it. Well, sure. The, the most important thing when you're making an Oprah request is to mention Oprah. As long as you say OPRA or the Open Public Records Act, then that is an OPRA request. Right. So if they and send me a form and say, you need to fill out this form, you can respectfully decline to fill out the form and just sending an email or a letter that is sufficient, right? That, that's correct. Under under the current rule, and there are towns like, I think it was West Berlin that John, uh, you know, they, they have a misunderstanding of what the law is. Mm -hmm. The law is that they are required to accept written OPRA requests. The requests do not have to be on the form. They do not have to use the official form. And they're required to accept uh, over requests in a, in a manner that's, that's hard copy, like mail or hand delivery, or a manner that's electronic. Mm -hmm. So that would be fax or email. Uh, previously, under the old law, a town could prohibit fax requests or email requests. But that rule was actually changed by the GOC. The GOC saw the light. So now it's, you don't have to leave your house, you don't have to get dressed, you can just be at your computer in, you know, nighttime, weekends, anytime, yes. and just send that email to make sure you mention Oprah and tell them what yes. you want. And then uh, what I usually do is I say, I make sure that I say I want the response via email. Mm -hmm. And then, how much does it cost? Well, it depends. If the records you want are in electronic format and you want them emailed to you, then the charge should be zero. Now, there could be exceptions, but if you're asking for electronic records, then the law supposed to be no charge. Mm -hmm. Paper copies are either five cents or seven cents. I think it's five cents a page. Okay, thank you. So uh, if, you, if you're worried that you might not know how many pages you're going to end up with, request it in electronic format, right? That would be good yes. advice. Uh, one, of, one of the best things you can do is ask the records to be scanned mm -hmm. and emailed to you. Because of who, what public agency doesn't have a scanner that is also a copier? Right. So that's, that's the best way. Ask them to be PDF emailed to you. And I, I think that helps everyone because if a document is emailed, then everyone has a record of what was sent and what was received. Cool. So you don't need to spend gas money. You don't need to make time during the business day to come to town hall. You don't have to use the form. All you need to do is know your rights. You can do it via email, and you can get the response via email. So a very powerful tool for people. Uh, yes, absolutely. Cool. Well, uh, you can learn a lot more about the OPRA law and the OPMA law, mm -hmm. the Open Public Meetings Act and the Open Public Records Act, at the Knights of Columbus in Perth Amboy on September the 20th. That's at 7 p.m. More info in our New London Today article about that event. Walter Lewis, the Vice President of NJ Fogg, and uh, the uh, main attorney at the Lewis Law Firm, mm -hmm. Please come back and join us again real soon, and we'll see you on the 20th. Looking forward to that event. Excellent. Thanks so much. You're welcome. My pleasure. All right. Thank you all at home for joining us. Please keep commenting. Give us your feedback. Tell us what you like, what you want to see more of. Tell us what you don't like, what you don't want us to do again. We'll be back tomorrow morning, uh, sometime in the morning. We're always trying to do it as early as possible. We'll have Teresa Vivar as our special guest, and uh, we got a lot of great news to share with you tomorrow. So please come back and join us on the New Brother Today show. Thanks, and we'll see you then.